With the goal of optimizing biological age, last week I got my blood tested for the sixth time in 2020. So what's my data? What's my biological age? So we can see that here um, using Morgan Levine's uh, phenotypic age calculator, which is uh, also a measure of biological age. We can see that my biological age uh, was 33.8 years. Now, when considering that my chronological age is 47, uh, that puts me, based on this blood test, at thir more than 13 years younger than my chronological age. Now, if you're interested in what's optimal for each of these nine biomarkers in terms of how they change during aging and what's their association for all-cause mortality risk, uh, you can click on the link in the right corner. I've discussed that in a previous video, so I'm not going to go over that again for this video. So uh, let's get further into my data. So for the first five blood tests uh, in 2020, uh, we can see the, my range of values from 33 all the way up to 39 years uh, uh, for uh, a biological age. Now, interestingly, note that that 39 measurement, and this will come up in a, in a later slide, I decreased my fat intake and increased my carb intake, and that may be what was related to that higher biological age compared to the other measurements. Now, when looking at all six uh, biological age uh, uh, data for the blood test, my average biological age in 2020 over six tests is 35.2 years, which is 11.8 uh, years younger than my chronological age. Not bad. Now, I, I, how does that compare to 2019? you know, year to year change of biological age. Now, I only measured twice in 2019 uh, with biological age, um, uh, biological ages of 37.3 years and 33.09 years, but the average of those two measurements is 35.2 years. So based on that, uh, one chronological year passed, but there technically are zero years of biological aging. Now, whether that's actually uh, completely true is unknown because, you know, I, I, are two blood test results enough to represent a full year of a biological age. I'd argue I'd needed more data, but from my perspective, it's encouraging that it didn't get worse. And um, yeah, so um, how, how does this, you know, basically flattening of aging, at least for a two-year period, how does this compare with other interventions? So um, I, had a, I made a video on this um, in terms of calorie restriction impacting biological age. And they didn't look at Levine's phenotypic age calculator. They used a different biological age calculator that was mostly derived from uh, clinical biomarkers uh, uh, that are in the blood. So it's just, they used a similar approach. So uh, starting from baseline, there was no difference in biological age for the two groups, uh, ad lib, where they ate whatever they, you know, their normal diet, uh, uh, and then CR, calorie restriction. Uh, so uh, and this was a 12 month uh, and 24 month. Up to 24 months, people were on calorie restriction. So what I want to highlight is after one year uh, of the study, the ad lib group who was eating their normal diet had an increase in biological age of 0 0.7 years. So one chronological year passed, they had 0.7 years of uh, biological aging. In contrast, the CR group, uh, and this was a 14.5% calorie restriction compared to their baseline diet, they only saw a uh, 0.1 year increase in their biological age. Now, note that the shaded blue uh, um, um, uh, region on the bottom is um, where the triangles are. That's the conf confidence interval for the uh, range of the effect of CR on biological age. So in other words, uh, most people, well, the average was a, a 0.1 year decrease in biological age, but some were a little bit higher than that and some were a little, a little bit lower. So it's within the realm of possibilities that some people on CR after one year had zero biological aging based on the, the you know, clinical biomarkers in blood as the metric. So similarly, uh, that's, that's essentially what happened to my data over that one year period. So was I on, the obvious question would be is, was I on calorie restriction uh, during 2020 when compared with 2019? So here's my daily calorie intake. And in, in addition to regular blood testing, I uh, weigh all of my food every day. I've been doing this for five years, five plus years since April of uh, 2015. Uh, and I track macros and micros. I have data, you know, in an Excel file for uh, more than 2,000 days with macros and micros. And, and uh, it wasn't until about two years ago that I thought, hey, I should start tracking actual food intake as an additional measure above and beyond macros and micros because breaking down food into, hey, it's got the, these macros and micros may not represent the whole impact that food can have on health. So here we see uh, daily calorie intake. And again, I weigh everything with a food scale uh, for 2019 in black and 2020 in red. So each dot corresponds to one day 
of data. So this is full data for two years, uh, daily calorie intake. And what we can see is that in 2019, my average daily calorie intake was 2,703 uh, 2, calories a day, whereas in 2020, it was uh, 2,587 2, calories per day. Now, using a t-test, we can see if these two groups of data are uh, different, statistically uh, di uh, different or the same. And uh, based on the t-test, uh, we can see that there was a small but significant reduction in calorie intake from 2019 to 2020, 4.3%. Uh, with a uh, statistically significant p-value of uh, 0.003. So there was a very mild calorie restriction. I, I basically had a very mild calorie restriction from uh, 2021 compared with 2019. So the obvious question is, is a relatively small CR enough to slow or stop year-to-year -year biological aging? So uh, based on this data, I'd argue that is possible, and it's actually encouraging because uh, the CR study that I posted on the previous slide where they had something like 14% CR, to see basically a very low increase in biological age uh, uh, one year into that study. Um, my data would argue that it, you know, it doesn't have to be a 14% or so reduction in calories to see an improvement in biological age. It could be as low as 4.4%. Uh, um, but I'd argue that many variables may be able to impact biological age. So what could those be? So were there fitness improvements? Now, um, uh, besides things like muscle strength, which are essentially the same, and I'll probably post some, you know, fitness updates, pull-ups, etc., uh, over the next few weeks. Um, uh, two metrics of of my fitness are uh, related to cardiovascular health, resting heart rate, and heart rate variability. So I also wear a fitness tracker that tracks those measures. So did I uh, dramatically improve in fitness uh, for RHR, resting heart rate, and HRV, or was it about the same? How does that impact biological age? So here's again two years of data. I've been tracking uh, these variables for more than two years. So this is uh, two full years of data, 2019 and 2020, for resting heart rate, uh, RHR, on the top, and heart rate variability, HRV, on the bottom. So first, I'm looking at uh, uh, resting heart rate on the, in the top. My average resting heart rate in 2019 was 48.8 beats per minute BPM, and I slightly improved that in 2020, uh, reducing it down, uh, which is going in the right direction, um, uh, to 48.1 uh, beats per minute. And then using a t-test, we can see that those, those two groups of data are actually significantly different. Now, I said that go, going uh, reducing a resting heart rate is going in the right direction, but it's also important to note that a resting heart rate decreases during aging. So one way we can uh, ascertain if that's a uh, fitness improvement-related improvement for resting heart rate or an aging-related uh, decrement for you know, so going in the wrong direction, it's basically a, a weaker heart now, um, is by assessing heart rate variability. And I actually made a video about this, the looking at the combination of resting heart rate and heart rate variability for uh, um, the, uh, assessing cardiovascular uh, health in a separate video. And if you're interested, you know, click on the right corner, you can, you can uh, access that video. So uh, how did my heart rate variability change during this two-year period? So we can see here, uh, purple 2019 and orange 2020. And uh, although it wasn't significantly different, the two, these two groups of data, my heart rate variability slightly went up from about 56 milliseconds uh, to about 58 milliseconds uh, in 2020. And it, this, uh, the, that small improvement was close to st uh, st statistical significance at, with a p-value of 0 0.07, but uh, you know that's not below the 0 0.05 threshold, so one could argue it's not, it's not uh, sit, uh, significantly different. But um, when considering that you know, I had a very small reduction in the resting heart rate, and the heart rate variability was actually going up and not down. One could argue that my um, metrics of cardiovascular uh, uh, health um, didn't get worse. At, at best, they stayed approximately the same, which is interesting because biological age sta stayed approximately the same. So I'd argue that one reason for why my biological age essentially stayed the same year over year from 2019 to 2020 is because I was able to main, maintain my uh, CV related, my cardiovascular uh, related health in terms of RHR and HRV at approximately the same levels 2019 into 2020. Now there's a third component uh, going further into the diet side of this is my, uh, is my drive towards precision nutrition. And what I mean by precision nutrition is, you know, within a whole food diet, it's easy to say eat real food and exercise, but within a whole food diet, what pattern actually translates into having the best metrics of of health and and actually minimizing disease risk and potentially maximizing longevity. That's one of my goals. So I'm just going to use C-reactive protein here 
uh, as an example. So my range for CRP in 2020 over six measurements was from 0.3 to 1.01 milligrams per liter. So going forward with the goal of keeping my biological age as youthful as possible, how can I get lower is better for CRP? So how can I get consistently closer to 0.3 on all of my measurements and you know avoid the 0.84 and 0.53, the higher measurements? Um, so as I mentioned, using a, an, an attempt at uh, getting closer to a precision nutrition approach can altering my diet composition impact C-reactive protein. So one way I can assess that is by looking at uh, correlations between parts of my diet with CRP. So uh, let's start with total calories and carbohydrates. So how, do, how does CRP correlate with those variables? Uh, so CRP in my data uh, over um, uh, about 12 measurements um, is not, I've only, I only started measuring CRP in the past two years or so since uh, Morgan Levine's biological age uh, calculator came out and I wanted to use that data to calculate biological age. I wish I had measured it more often earlier. So uh, CRP in my data not, is not significantly correlated with total calorie or carbohydrate intake. But not all carbohydrates are the same. Carbohydrates include fiber, which are polysaccharides, starch, which are disaccharides, and simple sugars, which are monosaccharides. And I raise this point because, uh, because all carbohydrates are not the same. Each of these will, you know, may impact C-reactive protein in different ways, but yet they're lost in looking, uh, you know, they're, they're, it, their effects may be blunted if you're going to combine them all into just one measure as carbohydrates. So let's have a look at those data. So how does CRP correlate with fiber, total fructose, and then remaining carbohydrates, which are uh, simple sugars, but also could be disaccharides. So CRP in my, in my data is not significantly associated with fiber, with total fructose intake, which is fructose, but also the sum uh, of, of uh, sucrose divided by two, since sucrose is, uh, contains fructose as half of it. Um, so CRP not associated with fiber or fructose, but what about the remaining carbohydrates? So carbohydrates minus fiber and minus fructose. And interestingly, in this situation, we see that the higher my simple carbohydrate intake, that's not fiber or fructose, the higher my CRP. So if my goal is to reduce CRP, um, if I keep my simple sugar and potentially disaccharide intake at the lower end of this range, I should see, if that's playing a causative role on impacting CRP, I should expect to see lower CRP levels consistently lower CRP levels. And I should mention that the correlation coefficient for my simple carb intake with CRP was very strong uh, at 0 0.85. So, um, and I'll, this, that, I'll raise that up, uh, that'll become important again in, in another, in a few slides. So keep that in mind that very strong correlation between my simple carb intake with C-reactive protein. So if I cut my simple carb intake, will calories from protein or fat make up the difference? So first, in looking at the correlation for CRP with protein, protein is not significantly correlated. So what about fat? Uh, so just looking at total fat intake, we can see that a significant correlation, an inverse correlation. So the higher my fat intake, uh, that, that's a, so, uh, correlated with a lower C-reactive protein. So if my goal is to keep CRP closer to 0 0.3, I should shoot for, at least based on extrapolation of this data, I should shoot for you know somewhere in the 110 grams of fat per day. But note that also all fat is not the same. So what's the see, fat is comprised of monounsaturated fats, MUFA, uh, polyunsaturated fats, which again all polyunsaturated fats are not the same. They include omega three and omega six, which are different fatty acid uh, structures, and also saturated fatty acids. So all fat is not the same. So uh, first, MUFA, monounsaturated uh, unsaturated fatty acids, are not significantly correlated with CRP. What about omega-3 and omega-6? Those two are not significantly correlated with C-reactive protein. But then interestingly, right at that border of uh, statistical significance, zero, uh, P equals 0 0.05, we see that um, what's likely driving the correlation with CRP is my saturated fat intake. Now, going further, all saturated fats are not the same. Now, my main sources of saturated fats are mostly from uh, cocoa beans. I make my own chocolate, I mix cocoa beans, I grind them up and mix them with dates, it's delicious. It's like the best chocolate I've ever had. Uh, uh, so cocoa beans, full fat yogurt, which the two of them are mainly long chain saturated fatty acids, uh, 16 carbon and 18 carbon fatty acids, but also coconut butter, which contains mostly medium chain fatty, uh, saturated fatty acids from eight to 12 carbons uh, in length for, for their, those fatty acids. So what's the correlation for CRP with those foods? 
So for cocoa beans, there that the, there is no there isn't a significant correlation with C-reactive protein. What about full fat yogurt? Again, uh, no significant correlation with C-reactive protein. But what about coconut butter? So here actually we can see a close to significant correlation for coconut butter with with C-reactive protein in ex exactly the same direction as what we saw for total sat saturated fatty acids and for total fat intake. Um, so that would suggest that by trying to get my coconut butter intake to somewhere around 50 grams per day, I may consistently see low C-reactive protein uh, levels, at least based on the data on that, on that graph. So th this data that I've shown may optimize C-reactive protein, but it's also important to, you know, to see if making these changes or if these correlations are associated with changes in the other biomarkers on Levine's biological age calculator. Because if I improve C-reactive protein by cutting my simple carb intake or increasing coconut butter, if that alters levels of other things that collectively make my biological age worse, well, we're going in the wrong direction. So will cutting fruit intake or including uh, the 50 grams of coconut butter a day uh, affect the other biomarkers? So uh, first, I'm looking at coconut butter, uh, CB, I've abbreviated it here. Uh, correlations for coconut butter with, with each of the other variables on Levine's biological age calculator, we can see that none of them are significantly uh, different. In other words, increasing coconut butter based on the correlations uh, is not significantly correlated with the other biomarkers. So it's possible that I may increase my coconut butter and see changes in CRP without changes in any of the other uh, uh, eight biomarkers that are on the test. Now, it's important to keep an eye on RDW because the uh, uh, higher coconut butter is correlated with a higher RDW in my data, uh, and it's not signif significantly different. The p-value is higher than 0 0.05, but it's close to significant. So if I improve or if I'm able to keep my C-reactive protein somewhere around 0 0.3 or less with these changes that I've, I've uh, indicated, but my RDW goes up, I may want to think about making some other uh, uh, interventions to keep RDW low um, uh, while also keeping CRP low. So what about my correlations with simple sugar intake with the other uh, variables on the biological age calculator? So this actually gets a little bit more complicated. Now remember, a lower, a lower simple sugar intake was cor correlated with a lower C-reactive protein, which is where you would want it. Lower is better for C-reactive protein. And I should mention I have a video for that too. If you're interested in the CRP video, click in, uh, in the right corner. Uh, so um, here we can see that... Uh, having a higher simple sugar intake is actually correlated with lower glucose, lower creatinine, and lower white blood cells, which are going in the actually the right direction in terms of aging and disease risk. So it's possible that if I cut my simple sugar intake, that may lead to increases in glucose, creatinine, and white blood cells, which would then go in the wrong direction. Um, it, now, conversely, um, it seems that cutting my simple sugar intake would lead to lower levels of MCV, since there's a positive correlation between MCV with my simple sugar intake. So, um, but note that the correlations for each of these components with sim simple sugar intake is less than 0.5 or negative 0.5, which is uh, considered a moderate or weak correlations. And the reason I raise that issue is because if you remember, the correlation for my simple sugar intake with C-reactive protein was very strong at 0.85. So it's possible that by keeping my simple sugar intake uh, low, and again, this is from Whole Foods, this is not junk food, I rarely eat junk food, you know, it's a few times a year that I'm eating something like pizza or, or cookies or something like that. Um, it's possible that by keeping that low, I'll keep my C-reactive protein low, and because of the weaker correlations with simple sugar with the other variables on the biological age calculator, that they may not end up becoming affected. Now, that's my hope. Uh, stay tuned in 2021 for further updates on my biological age and see if this actually ends up being true. Uh, so that's all I've got for now. Uh, thanks. Thanks. If you made it to the end, thanks. And uh, have a great day.